This video is not going to be like the previous videos that I've made or let's say the thousands of creators that make videos on the pros and cons of cybersecurity, how to get into the domain, certifications, courses, etc. This video is all about real life security events. Through this video, I'm going to be speaking about a security incident that took place at one of the organizations where I worked. What exactly was the whole life cycle of the security hack? right from discovery, analysis to mitigation. So if you want to know what exactly a cybersecurity professional does in the wild, then make sure you watch this video till the very end. How's it going guys and welcome to The Social Dork. My name is Royden and I work as a cybersecurity professional in multiple sectors. And if you've already been a subscriber of this channel, you probably know what are the different types of videos I make. If you haven't subscribed yet, do hit the subscribe button, hit the like button and let's get started with story time. Okay, so I was working as a network security engineer, which was part of the broader cybersecurity domain when this specific security incident occurred. I'll give you a little bit of a premise first. So the way the office building was structured, there was a separate section which belonged to security guards, which was mainly there for physical security purposes for anyone entering the building, exiting the building or, you know, cars that had to be parked on premise, signing visitors and all of that stuff. Now, these security guards, there were two desks right there. And uh, both of them had wired desktops, which were always connected. And there was no laptop facility or no BYOD facility for these security guards. The way the network architecture was, was that the desktops were connected into Cisco access switches, which were then connected into the distribution layer, the core layer, etc. The way this incident started was that one day, the help desk team got a call from one of the security guards stating that they no longer have internet access. Now, when you first hear of something like this, you probably think, okay, you know what? Maybe there's something wrong with the desktop, with the switch, with the cable, who knows? So what happens is as any incident or any ticket is raised, it first goes into the queue. It's handled by the level one frontline, which is your help desk professionals. And they try to fix the issue if, and for whatever reason they cannot, it then gets escalated to higher teams. But this one's fairly straightforward, right? A PC has no internet access, no network connectivity. They checked it, they saw what they noticed was, was that the switch port where this PC was connected went into an error disabled state. And the reason it went into an error disabled state was because something called as port security was triggered on the Cisco switches. Now for any network engineers in the building, you already know what port security is. But for those who don't know, this is an aspect of network security, which is enabled on your switches. So what it does is, is on the switch port that connects into any endpoint, you configure a static MAC address that should be visible at that switch port. Or what you can also do is you can say, okay, I only want five different MAC addresses that I should see on the switch port. If anything more than five, go into an error disabled state. And this is done so that, you know, no user can bring random laptops and just start plugging them into switch ports. Now, if you think about it, if it's just a wired desktop and no laptops, anything, why exactly would you have the MAC address count incrementing from one to five? Upon checking the ports, they noticed, okay, there were a few MAC addresses. You know what? They probably thought it's a mistake. It's an error, whatever. They reset the switch port, asked the user to monitor if there were any issues and report back. A couple of days later, again, the same thing. Error disabled state, five MAC addresses seen again on the switch port. Now, what they thought was, you know, maybe there's something wrong with the OS of the Cisco switch. So a ticket was raised with the vendor. And this is how, by the way, you also troubleshoot with vendors. If you notice any issue with like a vendor device, you raise a TAC case with the vendor support and then they can look at their product and see what exactly is going on. Now, in this specific instance, the TAC from Cisco looked at it and they were like, you know what? There's no bug associated with the OS. So there's nothing much we can do. It's probably something you've got to investigate. So what was done was a different switch port was used on the same switch. They even replaced the cable, the level one help desk guys. And they thought, okay, you know what? Let's see if this fixes the problem. Now, what happened was again, after a couple of days, you had five different MAC addresses seen on this new switch port this time, and they were completely baffled. And this is where it got now escalated to the more specialized teams. And that's when it came into the network security queue. And I happened to be working on this specific incident. Now, immediately looking at it, thinking with my security hat on, I found it extremely fishy. In the first place, if it's a wired desktop, you shouldn't see five different MAC addresses on there. I wouldn't even go as far as, you know, changing the switch port or any of that sort. If I was the front line of defense, I would probably 
immediately be investigating the logs to see what exactly was going on with this machine. Now, because this ticket was assigned to me and um, I was at the time in the same building, what I did was I thought, you know, I'll just go and have a look uh, and meet with the security guard because he was pretty disgruntled as well because he was constantly losing access. So I went to the specific location, met with the security guard, asked him a couple of questions. How often does this happen? Uh, what is the nature of when it happens? Does he see any signs in the computer? Any of that sort. But there was none of that. All he said was he would just abruptly lose network connectivity. So while I was there, what I did was I immediately opened a command prompt on the machine. Upon opening the command prompt, I ran a command called netstat. Now what netstat does is it shows you all the open connections or any connections that are being opened from that PC to any other destination. And what I saw was pretty surprising because I saw that the PC was constantly opening TCP connections to all these random IP addresses every two to three seconds. And the reason it was strange was because there was no background internet tasks or any applications that were running, which would need constant internet access. So it would need to open these connections with all of these different IP addresses. So what I did was ensure that the PC was indeed physically disconnected by plugging out the cable and um, went up to look at some of the firewall logs. And this is where reading of logs comes in very handy. You can use seam tools, you can use the generic firewall logs on the GUI of the firewall itself. But we had a seam solution in Splunk. So what I did was I tried to investigate this specific source IP address in Splunk over let's say the past two to three weeks. And uh, what I did notice was it was also running host sweep scans within the network. Now, what a host sweep scan is, is that a PC tries to ping all of these random IP addresses within the network it belongs to see what devices are active and up within the network. And this under a security event is classified as information gathering where, you know, a malicious device or an attacker is trying to get as much information as they can about their target environment. And if you collate all of these evidences together, including random MAC addresses appearing on the switchboard, these bogus IP addresses that the device was trying to connect into, or even the host sweep scans, you can clearly tell that there's something going on with this specific machine. And by the way, if you sort of correlate this to the incident response life cycle, the discovery phase was where you discover what's going on. And this is more of the analysis. So as you can see in the initial phases of discovery or analysis, you need to have really strong foundations when trying to uncover anything. And if you want to do this, you've got to make sure that you've got your basis covered. That includes the CompTIA Netbook Plus, Security Plus, Cybersecurity Certifications or any cybersecurity courses. But other than this, if let's say you've got all of these resources, but you find it difficult to hold yourself accountable to, you know, study from time to time and get these certifications done with deadlines and all of that stuff, I've got something known as Wisdom Plan for you. What Wisdom Plan does is that it's your own personalized study tutor or study tool. And what you do is you create plans in Wisdom Plan regarding whatever you want to do when it comes to studying courses or certifications. You put in the dates, you put in the number of hours you want to do per day. It's like your to-do list but on steroids and it also helps you hold yourself accountable and even gives you a certificate once you're done with your study plan. But other than this, they've also got a feature which is called as AI Tutor. And what the AI Tutor feature does is that you just input in whatever you want to study. Like for example, in my case, I created a new plan from scratch saying I wanted to study the CompTIA Network Plus. You put in the few descriptions, say whatever you want to use as resources, whether it could be videos, blog articles, or even projects if you want to, you know, do the real hands-on stuff, which I highly recommend if you want to go ahead in cybersecurity. You need to have good practical knowledge. So you put all of that in and you just wait for the AI to work its magic. And what it does is, as you can see, it gives you a complete detailed plan and you can start watching these videos. You can start completing these tasks one by one. And by the time you finish it from start, to the end, you would be ready with whatever you wanted to achieve out of it in the first place. And what it also does is it gives you a certificate that, you know, here you go. You've done well for yourself and happy days. So coming back to the story, as part of further analysis, what was then done was sandboxing. So sandboxing is a procedure where you completely isolate a malicious machine just to see what exactly you can get more out of it. So it was completely isolated by putting it in a new zone on the firewall and in a completely separate VLAN just to see what the machine was doing. It was then passed over to the digital forensics team. Digital forensics deals with understanding what exactly went on with the machine itself by analyzing any dumps, by analyzing any logs. And the tools they use for these are example volatile. And upon completion of their analysis, it was confirmed 
that this machine was part of a command and control type of security attack. So in command and control, what happens is, is that this PC functions as a bot. And there are thousands or millions of PCs like that, which are part of this whole network. And what they do is, they just take commands from these centralized servers that are all around the globe. And they perform various actions based on whatever is sort of commanded to them by these central servers. And it was also confirmed that the PC got infected because of a malicious program that was downloaded by this user when visiting a website. So what this user was doing was that he was visiting a website when unintentionally clicked on an ad or a link, which led to a malicious virus being downloaded on his PC. Luckily, it didn't spread to any of the other devices. But the good thing for us was that when it came to good security principles, along with port security, which I spoke about earlier, we also used VLAN segmentation. So what VLAN segmentation does is that it completely isolates one sub-network from another sub-network. So this is what worked for us, is that this PC only had access to, let's say, the other security guard PCs and not to any other internal resources. So when it came to damage control or when it came to preventing the spread, we already had good controls in place. But once all of this is done, as part of the incident response lifecycle, you then come to documentation and learning. And this specific incident was indeed documented. There were more rigid principles created around what websites can users access and more controls in place to uh, whether or not files could be downloaded or immediately blocked by the browser when, you know, something's being downloaded in the background. Other than this, what probably didn't work for us in this phase was our endpoint detection. Again, I'm not going to be taking names of the vendor that we used in this case, but the endpoint detection failed because the PC should have been reported in the first place if it was seen doing something malicious by endpoint detection, but probably completely missed that. So there you go, guys. This is an example of what exactly a security incident or a security event would look like or what a cybersecurity professional would work on. I mean, I speak a lot about, you know, looking at seam logs, firewall zones, VLANs, false positives, false negatives, but this is how it all ties up into a real world scenario. So yeah, while it's all well and good, knowing the pros and cons, what courses you need to do, you also need to be familiar with this is exactly what the day of a cybersecurity engineer could look like. I've also got a complete video on how to be a SOC analyst. If that's something you want to be in 2025 and if cybersecurity interests you, you can find that video right here. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.